All right. Hello, everybody. We're going to start the talk now. So welcome. Um, we're going to present our talk, Developing Grease Pencil at the Spa Studios. Some of you may know us, some of you may not, so um, about us. Um, my name is Falk. Um, I'm a software developer from Germany. And my Blender journey began as a developer in June 2020 when I did a Google Summer of Code um, on Grease Pencil. And I implemented the um, curve editing where you could manipulate strokes uh, using Bezier curves. And then soon after, a couple of months later, I uh, joined the Blender Foundation uh, through a developer grant and I joined the uh, triaging and bug fixing team. And then later on also worked on, on Grease Pencil uh, on the module itself. And then in June 2021, I joined the, the Spa Studios. And I'm Jan, so I'm a software developer from France, and I have um, been working in the industry for around 10 years now in both animation and VFX studios. Uh, and around three years ago, I started implementing Blender in production pipelines. So our path with Falk collided when we both joined the Spa Studio in 2021. So the Spa Studio is a 2D-centric animation studio, also known for embracing 3D techniques when it helps with supporting the story and achieve creative goals. And they demonstrated that on Klaus, a movie that was fully 2D animated, but also shaded and lit to achieve this stylized 3D rendering look. And it looks like this. Cool. Um, hello? Just put your hands on the fan. Mr. Klaus, you have a gift. You were meant for making toys. So I figured if you donate your old toys, I'll deliver them for free. Tonight, I go with you. There's no need for you to come with me, really. Tonight, then. Right, so Blender was not part of the Klaus pipeline. But already some complex shots require the use of 3D to help with layouting the action as shown in this short clip. Right, so obviously um, not all shots on class required such a setup, uh, but building them was a bit complicated because it required moving between software packages not necessarily designed to play well together. And with the ambition of the studio to push cinematography further for the upcoming project, Ember, uh, the need to combine 2D and 3D more seamlessly became really a key aspect, a key problematic for the studio. And well, whether for storyboarding, uh, animation, previous layout, this is the point where the studio decided to look into Blender and Grease Pencil. And a uh, few supervisors started playing with the software and looking at the strengths, but also what was missing. And this is where we try to help them. All right, so here's an overview of our talk. Um, we're going to do uh, basically like three examples of where we improve Blender and um, especially a Grease Pencil. Um, and then also um, we're gonna have a, talk, uh, a section just on how we develop Blender and we're gonna talk about like a big topic which is contributions obviously. Um, and in the drawing animation tools, I'm gonna be talking mostly about Grease Pencil. Um, and in performance, um, so, in early tests, we already had performance issues with Grease Pencil. Um, so um, we had to fix those. And in that section, we're going to talk about how we approach that and uh, how we, we fix those. Um, and then Jan is going to expand a bit um, and talk about uh, storyboarding, layout. So not only Grease Pencil, but um, going a bit outwards. And um, he's going to present that. Um, yeah. Uh, let's get started. So, drawing animation tools. Um, 
very early on, uh, when Blender was considered, uh, we had an animation supervisor try out Blender and look at what are the limitations, um, you know, can we do animation in Blender? And so we got a list of, uh, a long list of feedback on um, what needed to be improved and sort of a um, minimum requirement for, for them to consider Blender for animation. And one of the first things that he noticed was that he was constantly switching between draw mode and edit mode. So uh, drawing a stroke and trying to quickly adjust it, just moving it slightly or rotating it slightly or scaling it, um, required going to edit mode and finding a tool or a shortcut and, and um, that was breaking his workflow. So we tried to come up with a solution, uh, we call it the, the quick edit. Um, and for all of these changes that I'm going to talk about, these are core Blender changes, they're not add-ons. Um, yeah, just to keep that in mind. Um, so I looked at uh, modal operators, um, I looked at uh, then gizmos, uh, which seemed like uh, a better fit. So uh, for those of you who know, don't know, Blender has like a, a pretty good gizmo API uh, where you can build your custom sort of interactive tools. And um, so I built on that and it quickly became clear that that was uh, the best option. Um, so the quick edit is uh, a tool in draw mode um, and well, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you. Um, so here you can see me use it. Um, no? It works, it works. It does? Yeah, it was working. Okay. <laughs> Press again. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so on the, on the left side, you can see I have now a lasso selection tool. And when you select a stroke, it pops up the gizmo. Um, and it's ex exactly what you expect from other softwares. It um, has all the basic things. Uh, so you, here I'm showing like control uh, lasso select into deselect. When you grab the box, it moves it. And here I'm showing that when you have an overlapping stroke, you can alt click to select through the box because normally it, that would you know grab it if you just left click. Um, yeah, it has all the basic features like scaling from a corner, scaling from the side. Uh, it can rotate. Um, you can also change the pivot to somewhere else and rotate around that. Um, you can reset the box just by clicking on a tool that just resets it. Um, and then we also have proportional scaling, you know, just showing that here. Uh, scaling from the center. Yeah, just all the common things. It also has skew, so you can grab a, a side and, and skew your selection. Like that was also requested by the animators. Um, yeah, and here I'm just showing that you also have in the toolbar options to mirror the selection, so you can quickly like mirror from the bounding box. Um, and shortcuts for deleting, copying, things like that, um, also with your selection. Um, now one thing that's interesting about this is that this tool is like inherently 2D, right? But Chris Pencil Strokes are fully 3D, so how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and so this is what this, this next video shows here, is um, I have a selection here, and what we do is that we always use the drawing plane that you're currently drawing on to, um, to stick the gizmo to that plane. Because it's, like, it's really designed for that quick edit workflow where you're just trying to edit um, your selection. So you can see that yeah, the smiley always sticks to, to that canvas. Yeah. All right, another feedback that we got was um, tools for um, animation. So one example was that um, people wanted to draw in-betweens and one really common workflow from like the old days when you would animate on paper um, is that you would take your two keyframes, you know, shift them in place and then draw your in-between on top using a light table or whatever. And um, so that workflow is known as shift and trace. Um, and so there, there wasn't really anything in Blender that could do that. But because we already had this 
custom built gizmo um, that could do these sort of transformations. Um, what we decided to do is to add a sort of non-destructive um, transformation matrix to keyframes uh, so that you can adjust your, your keys um, as you go. And since it's non-destructive, you can just toggle it on and off uh, to see those uh, transformations. So this is another tool that we built. It's called, well, Shift and Trace. Um, so yeah, obviously we can't show anything from, from the project the guys are working on. So um, here's my simple example of drawing an in-between between like a, a rectangle and a, um, a triangle. Um, so that's the tool. You just select it and then you alt left click to select your keyframe and it pops up the, the gizmo. And again, it's the same gizmo that we already built for, for the quick edit. And it allows you to transform your stroke. So here I'm just showing translation, but you can just scale, rotate, anything you want. Um, and then just uh, draw your, <laughs> draw your in-between, which is, I don't know, <laughs> some shape in-between. <laughs> um, and since, again, since this is non-destructive, uh, it's just uh, getting applied after the modifiers on the, on the evaluated object. Um, you can toggle it on and off. So here I'm toggling it off, adjusting it since it's like a bit too high maybe. Um, and yeah, here you can see the in-between. And um, the tool also allows you to just reset the transformation. Uh, so you can basically start from where the original position was and you can also use the current frame. So if you want to use timeline to select a key that you want to shift, or the friend you want to shift, um, you can you can do that as well. All right. Um, now another thing that uh, animators ask for is improving the drawing feeling, which is always <laughs> not a great thing to hear as a as a developer. <laughs> they said things like, "Hey, we want to draw like we draw on paper, and uh, you know have that level of responsiveness." Um, so we looked at the uh, current grease pencil drawing operator and I looked at things that we could improve in it. Um, and we found a couple of things that uh, we, we could have improved. Um, when we dug deeper, we found that Blender already has a pretty good um, like basic painting operator built in that's like used by you know, uh, vertex paint for mesh, meshes and, and things like that, like painting on images. And so, we thought it would be better to start a new drawing operator <laughs> um, and start from that same base since it's already there um, and build it um, using C++ uh, and sort of a new, um, um, new way of doing things. Um, it has a few things uh, that I would like to talk about. Um, we have spacing modes. Um, so this is just about, you know, how the points are being spaced on your stroke. Uh, default is basically just using uh, the default tablet inputs that you get or the mouse. Um, fixed um, gives you spacing relative to um, the radius of your stroke. Um, so 10%, 10% of the radius and that's the distance between each point. Fixed is really, really useful if you use dot materials. So if you want to build like a realistic looking like charcoal pencil, you would use like a randomly rotated texture of a charcoal image and then place that on each point. And, and for that, you need this dense uh, stroke. And then adaptive, which is really useful for line materials where uh, you don't need that many points and uh, you have a threshold for it to remove unnecessary points when they are like on a straight line, for example. Um, so those are the different modes and um, yeah. Next we have active smoothing. So this is something that the old operator already had, but the way it worked was if you had um, three points that were like placed in a like certain distance, uh, it would generate a circular arc uh, using those th three points. Um, and so our animators had this like, they, they said it was like feeling floaty and not precise. Uh, so we looked at trying to revamp, revamp that. Um, and 
our active smoothing is like based on, on a Gaussian uh, blur algorithm um, that's al also already in Blender. Um, but it's applied to the whole stroke um, and also while you draw. Um, so you can see here on, on the very left uh, with no active smoothing, um, when you draw and you zoom in, you can see that the points are getting snapped to the finite resolution that you have on your tablet. So basically the pixel resolution. So you get the stepping out effect, um, which is not nice. Um, and then with active smoothing, what you're basically trying to achieve is the sub-pixel accuracy uh, where the, the point is really placed um, where it should be, which is like in a sub-pixel resolution. Um, and then finally, it also has curve fitting. Um, so curve fitting is like, uh, again, implemented natively. Um, and it, pl it applies the fitting after you've drawn the stroke. Um, so, so this is um, sort of a, a post-process uh, step. With all of these, by the way, we try to make it so that they don't affect each other. So if I use a fixed sampling and I use curve fitting, it doesn't use the points of the curve, for example, that it generates. Uh, it still uses your original samples um, and sort of morphs the stroke into place. Um, so here I have a couple of videos. This is with a threshold of 0.1. You can't really tell. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, with 0.1, it's basically impossible to tell. 0.5, you can like see a slight adjustment just after the stroke is being drawn with like a slight delay. Maybe you've seen that, maybe not. <laughs> it's really obvious if you put it like all the way to, to one though. So um, here you can see, bloop, yeah. Um, this is how the, the panel looks like. Um, sort of the revamped, um, and this is, this is like all you ever need to change to get the right feeling of, of the drawing. Um, so we really wanted, like the, one of the core designs was to have very few options, but make it so that they really have like um, the right effect. So if you turn all of these off, you get raw tablet input. There's no, there's like we do nothing to it. But when you, you know, use them, um, you can really tweak them to your liking and, and get the right feeling. That was one of the goals because obviously like all the animators are different and like one will say, oh, but it doesn't feel right. And the other one will say this. So it was really important to have like these buildings blocks that you can then, you know, adjust the settings to get the right feeling. Um, all right, um, that, was, that was the drawing operator. Um, so now we're gonna talk about performance. Um, so as I said earlier, in, in like earlier tests with our animation supervisor, we already ran into issues. So these are mainly um, if your file is getting to a certain size, if you have like a million, two million grease pencil points, um, you, can, you can feel the slowdown. So after each stroke you draw, for example, you get like a slight delay um, where Blender is like trying to catch up and, and you can really feel the lag at some point. So we started to profile. This is a profile of um, drawing a grease pencil stroke. And we can see like three major columns <laughs> where time is spent. And the first one here is the dependency graph update. So this is after drawing a stroke, um, the, the copy on write kicks in. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about copy on write and everything like that uh, in just a minute. Um, and basically you have to do a copy of the, of the data block and that's what you see at the top there. So that takes a long time. Uh, the block in the middle is actually really good. That's just drawing the viewport basically and, and all the rendering, which, which is where we want to spend most of the time. <laughs> so that's good. But then on the right we have um, the undo system. And when you draw a stroke just after the operator, the undo system has to encode an undo step so that you can undo. And just encoding that step also takes a long time. Um, so we're going to talk about the two major issues, which is uh, copy on write and undo. I'm going to do copy on write. Jan is going to take over after that. So to explain what we did, we're going to first look at the grease pencil data block. So we have like a better understanding of, of what, what's happening here. Um, on the left, you have an example of what you might see in Blender. Um, so here we have a grease pencil data block with a single layer, it's called lines, um, and two keyframes, one on frame one, one on frame four. And on frame four, we have a stroke. Um, and on the right, you can see how this data block might be represented in memory. So at the very top, we have the data block. Then we have all the layers underneath there. 
In this case, we just have one. And then for all the layers, we have all the frames. In this case, we just have two frames on layer one. And finally, on all of the frames, we have all the strokes. So here, we just have one stroke on frame four. Um, and you can clearly see this tree-like structure that's built by the grease pencil data block. And remember that because we're going to take advantage of that now. So let's talk about copy on write um, and why it's important. So in Blender, we have this uh, core concept that data blocks can be um, changed non-destructively. And in order to do that, we need to operate on a copy of the original data block. So what you'll have is the original data block on the left here and an evaluated state of the data block on the right. So we copy the original data and then, for example, modifiers would just get applied to the evaluated state so that we don't change the original. Now, every time you do something to the original, you have to destroy the evaluated state and copy it over, right? Because you have to start from scratch basically every time. Now, this becomes a problem when your grease pencil object contains millions of points uh, for obvious reasons. So we had to come up with a solution how to not do that, um, basically. Um, and well, the simple idea is why not just get rid of the things that changed and not destroy everything? And this is what we call the update on write. So uh, when something changes in the evaluated state, we just destroy what changed and copy that over, and the rest is kept. Um, yeah, and our solution to that is, is what we call the update cache. Um, so I'm going to try to explain what that does now. Um, it's a structure that lives in the runtime data of the grease pencil object, so it's not safe to file anything. It's just there to really make the copy on write faster. And it's structured a bit like this, so it also is structured like a tree, and it has these nodes. And every node has um, an index, a flag, and some children, but we don't talk about the children. Um, they're, they're not important <laughs> in this case. <laughs> um, so the index is the index of the element that changed in the original data block. So if you have like a set of layers and your, your second layer changed, and you have an index of one in there, and that's sort of saved in the nodes that we can find it later on. And uh, then we have a flag. Uh, which can indicate that we want to update nothing. Mm -hmm. We want to do a light update or full updates. Um, why we want to say that we want to change nothing is important because, well, let me show you an example. So let's say we're drawing a stroke on a frame. Um, in that case, we want to tag the frame because we want to copy the full, fr the full frame um, for an update. And so on the right here, you would um, have what the data block roughly looks like. And then what's outlined in blue is what the data structure of the update cache would look like. So you have two nodes, and those nodes don't contain any flags, so they flag nothing. But we need them because we need to find that frame in the right position. So what those nodes still do is they still hold an index um, so we can walk down the tree and find the element that changed. And then when something is tagged for a full update, um, we not only copy itself, but all of its content, so all of the stroke inside of the frame, for example. Uh, when it's tagged for a light update, we only copy things that are inside of the frame, things like the selection status. Uh, so when you deselect a frame, you don't want to copy all the strokes, so we want to do like a light update. Um, and this is what the update hash uh, looks like. So now when you do... Um, a copy on write, we can check for if there is an update cache present. Don't do the copy on write, just do an update on write and just destroy what's needed and replace, this, replace um, that by what's needed. All right, um, I think now yep. it's time. All right, so we saw earlier that there were two main bottlenecks, so we just like uh, resolved the update on write. Uh, and now the next big topic is uh, the undo system. Because uh, by default, Blender uses this global approach, right? It's the memfile undo system. So the general idea is that whenever you make a change, well, the undo system encodes the state of that file in memory in the undo step. And this global approach is really depending on the file size. So the bigger the file, the longer it takes. Uh, and the problem is that in heavier production files, 
uh, this can become a real problem since drawing a stroke uh, will have some delay after that. And uh, same goes for undoing. Um, and on top of that, um, we can see that it triggers on the right a copy on right, as Falk was saying, after undoing. Um, so to try and uh, address that, we wanted to go away from this global approach. And um, because drawing, undoing, and drawing again is probably the action the artists do the most during the day, right? And we wanted to make this as fast as possible and clearly not dependent on the file size. So the same way uh, meshes have undo system for edit mode, we decided to implement a grease pencil, a grease pencil undo system, which would be really responsible for taking care of grease pencil modification in any edition mode, right? So I'm talking about draw, sculpt, and edit mode. And uh, this system is based on the one-way differential approach. So basically, the idea is that an, un an undo step would encode only in memory the change from the last state, right? But to be able to do that, we need to know what changed from the last state. And fortunately, with the update on write work, we do have such a thing, which is called the update cache. So we can rely on that to know what changed precisely and rely on this information. So let's take a look with an example of what happens when we use the grease pencil undo system. So at the top, you have this grease pencil data block, as you know it now. And at the bottom, you'll see a representation of the undo steps we encode. So first action, you just enter draw mode on your grease pencil object. When that happens, the grease pencil data block gets tagged for update. And from there, the undo system kicks in and in this case, encodes a full copy of the data block because we can't make a differential uh, evaluation from any unknown state, right? So we need to make this full copy. Also, internally, the undo system uses the same structure as the update cache, but it will copy and own a copy of the original data block. So everything that you see in green at the bottom is a copy of the original data. Okay, so next action just let's just draw a stroke on the first keyframe. In this case, the keyframe gets tagged for update and the grease pencil undo system uses this information and encodes a step that only contains a copy of the frame that contains one stroke. Let's repeat that and just draw another, keyframe, another stroke on the same keyframe. Same process and that leads to a third step that contains a copy of the stroke with uh, the frame with two strokes. Now what happens when we want to undo the last action? Well, we can go back in time and look at step two. And as you can see here, step three and step two uh, have the exact same level of information because they both encode the change of the same keyframe. So what we can do is, is basically applying step two, like if you were redoing, basically. And when we do that, well, we reach the target state we were before step three. Okay, that, would, that was easy enough. Uh, so now, oh yeah, sorry. Finally, the update cache, uh, the, the undo system also tags the keyframe for update, meaning that the next depth graph update can use that and do an update on write instead of a copy on write, which is like a win-win relationship between the two systems. Right, so now let's try to do something a bit more difficult and delete the second keyframe here. So in this case, since the layer structure change, we encode um, we tag the layer for update. And we have now an undo step that contains a copy of the layer with only one keyframe. Now what happens if we want to undo that and reach the state where we had two keyframes? Well, again, we can go back in time. But the problem is that here, step two is a uh, encodes a keyframe level change and it clearly doesn't contain enough information compared to step three, right? So it doesn't contain the missing keyframe that we need. So are we just stuck there? Well, no, what we need to do is go back a bit more in time and try to find a step that contains enough information to revive that missing keyframe. Okay, so let's take a look at step one now. Well, this one is a full copy of the data block, right? So it contains as much information it, as it can be. It's the highest level of uh, information. So it contains the missing keyframe. We can just restore that state. And now, um, well, we can just go back to the future somehow 
and uh, reapply step two on top of that because we want that stroke on the first keyframe too. Right, so this example shows how crucial it is to have a full copy of the data block at beginning of the undo chain because we want to be able to fall back to this point in history to be able to restore any type of change we make later on. And the question might be, what happens if we reach the uh, maximum number of undo steps that is user defined? Because then in this case, we need to, to free the first undo step, right? So if that happens, then we look at step two. And if it's not a full copy of the entire data block itself, then we take it and we just apply it on step one. And this merged version becomes the new step one. And in this case, we always have a full copy. Right, so this undo system is really dedicated to optimizing performance when it comes to modifying the active grease pencil data in draw sculpt edit mode. Anything outside of this is really out of the scope of this undo system. And in this case, we just fall back to memfile. Right, so if we change, for instance, like the color of the material, uh, then we let memfile takes care of that. And uh, if the next action is drawing a stroke, well, in this case, we can re-enter the grease pencil on the system, but we have to encode this full copy to uh, maintain this principle. So it's kind of the best trade-off because it means that we can undo anything at any time, uh, but at the cost of some potential hiccups when we switch between steps that are different undo system types. So this um, it has been in production for several months and it proves to be um, stable. And as you can see, it can lead to uh, some dramatic uh, changes like in terms of performance for things like drawing a stroke. Um, and we have submitted this as a public patch also. And we got review, really interesting review uh, with important things to fix and improve, which we mostly did internally, but we still have work to do on this to contribute uh, and update the patch. Right. Um, so talking about going back in time again, uh, let's jump to the next and last case study, which is the first thing we started working on when we joined the studio. So uh, at first, the studio uh, thought of Blender for storyboarding, uh, because being able to, to mock up 3D uh, backgrounds and place cameras, but still be able to end draw characters is a feature set that many story artists are looking for. And um, we, they were left with one big question, which was, okay, it's great, I can draw, but how do I organize my work and actually build shots and build that into a sequence? And to answer that question, we knew that Blender had a lot of features that we could use to cover for that use case. Uh, and really building that sequence workflow was about connecting those pieces together. So. This workflow rel relies on the fact that we can have multiple scenes in the Blender file. Uh, at least one action scene, which would be the scene which contains the animated action of the sequence. An edit scene that would contain, well, the edit of the sequence. And shots within that edit scene that would define a camera, an action scene, and both an editing time range and an action scene time range. And as we wanted to build something really well integrated into Blender and uh, easy to maintain, um, we wanted to really rely on Blender native capabilities to address this. But the, the good thing is that if you look at this and you just use scene strips for shots, then it directly translates to a sequence editor timeline, which also means that then we can use the VSE to uh, be the main hub of the sequence and manipulate, edit it. Right, so another question is, how do we bring all those scenes together? Well, by um, ideally, you would like to always see the edit timeline when you work in the sequence, right? But the problem is that a Blender window by design is only showing one scene at the time. You could open several windows, but then it's becoming a bit hard to manage sometimes. So to address that problem, uh, we made a call change, and it's basically the idea of having a scene override on the space sequence editor. Right, so basically the end result looks like this. You can now show in a sequencer region uh, a scene that is not the one of the main window. And in this case, well, 
we can start building a sequence. And how do we, again, make this work together now? Because we have to create some links between those scenes. Well, to, to do that, uh, we created this um, timeline synchronization system. So it's implemented in Python. Like, uh, uh, like starting from here, all you're going to see is basically an add-on. Um, and this idea relies uh, on the fact that we want that when the user scrubs the, the edit timeline, everything else updates to be in the good shot context, right? So if the time change here, we have this callback of the frame change post handler, which is really what we use for the core of that system. And we look for the active strip under the time cursor. And if we found one, we just use the correct action scene, the correct camera, and we remap the global edit time to the scene local time. Right. But now let's see it like in action. So as we cannot show any production content yet, uh, we will be using shots from the Euro short film from uh, Daniel Martinez Lara and the Blender Foundation. Uh, those files were uh, accessible on, on the Blender cloud. <clears throat> All right. So let's start with those two shots that could be belong to the same sequence. So basically, we just appended those scenes from the original files and made really a few minor tweaks. Um, so first, let's override the scene in the sequencer to use and show an empty edit scene. You can notice that moving the time does not update the action scene anymore. So now let's add some shots to this. So the workflow come with tools to create new shots with the correct settings and naming. And here I'm just like creating a few shots using uh, the two action scenes we just imported. By activating the synchronization, synchronization system, now the edit scene drives the system. So basically when I move the time down there, it updates the scene to show the correct thing. Also, in this action scene, we added a camera that is closer to the action, and we want to make a cut of that. Like, we want to make a shot out of that. So basically, to create a new shot, we can just rely on the VSC and cut where we need to make the shot in and out. And out. Out. Uh, now we have those three shots using the same scene, and we want the middle one to use the correct camera. To end with that, we have this sequence panel at the top where you have the list of the shots. You can click on it and just assign the correct camera. And you'll see that it changes now when I start a playback there. OK, the transition is a bit fast, so let's fix that. So to add a bit more sequence context to the action scene, we have, as you can see, this overlay here that is interactive, allows you to switch from shot to shot, but also retime the shot. And here I'm just like creating some more overlap. All those interactions are using Dop sheet gizmos. Um, once we have done this kind of overlap, well, the transition is a bit smoother. And seen from the outside, if you pay close attention, you'll see the action repeating. Yeah. So obviously, all of this is possible in native Blender, right? It's just that with those additional tools and context, it's becoming a bit easier to really understand which portion of the scene you're using. <clears throat> and it might help to do some non-linear editing like here. So the workflow relies on having an edit scene, but we can actually use as many as we want to store versions and uh, takes of the sequence. So here we'll switch to a more advanced version of that sequence. And this one only contains an additional shot to help with the transition between the two scenes. And as you can see, we rely again on non-linear editing here because we just reuse a portion of the first scene from a different point of view. Right, now let's switch to an even more advanced version. Here we added two additional shots and sound because yeah, since we're using the VSE, we can also do the sound design at sequence level, which is really important from some, for some steps. Um, okay, now let's create a title. So we have this idea of template scenes. Basically, user can create a template scene. Here, we just have a grease pencil object, white background, perfect for a title. We create a shot from that, from that template, and it duplicates the template to create a new unique scene, and the shot uses that scene. So now we have something independent we can work on and write a very inspired title. Um, OK, but since it's a title, it would be better at the beginning of the sequence. So, well, let's just use the alt arrow keys native in Blender to put it here and use the dropsheet gizmo again to adjust the timing. 
and we are helped by the fact that it sticks to the handle when the, the time cursor stick to the handle when doing that. Right, so at this point, we're just doing like editing. We don't even have to really realize what's happening underneath, which action scene we're working with. It's really what we were looking for, like being as close as possible as you know, classic editing experience. And one other important thing when it comes to integrating Blender in production pipeline is being able to communicate with other departments. And in that case also means the editorial department, which generally works with media files. So we need to render that out. <clears throat> okay, so let's clean up the sequence a bit. Uh, we have this tool that allows to rename the shots, so they are like in a chronological order. And then once this is set, we can just go to the batch render settings, which describes some s parameters on how to render the scene. We have this option to render additional frame handles, so you can have more content on the left and the right of the shot. We have this output scene that we define, we'll see just after, and we can start the render. So here, basically, the batch render is a model operator that has a list of tasks to accomplish and consume sequentially. So each shot is a task and then the resulting media would be uh, put in that output scene to recreate the exact same edits, but this time with media, as we can see here. And also the sound was copied. Um, and as we define frame handles, well, we can see that each clip contains additional content on the left and the right, which will give some creative freedom for the editorial team. And then to uh, send that to editorial, uh, we can use this um, open timeline IO integration that de we developed for that purpose. In our case, we can generate like an AF file um, because like the target software at Spa is Avid. And uh, yeah, this is basically how we can build our sequence and communicate with the editorial department uh, at the Spa Studio. Um, okay, so code wise, uh, you've seen this uh, sequencer scene override. Uh, I mean, it works. We are using it in production, but we still have the feeling that we could probably come up with a better design for that specific feature. So this is why it's not like a public patch yet. We might just talk about it afterwards if anyone is interested in that discussion. Uh, but uh, yeah, talking about like how we contribute and the philosophy at the Spa Studio, I'll let uh, Falk... Uh, Continue. <laughs> yeah, so obviously uh, contributing to the Blender project is a big topic, right? Because um, we've shown stuff that we built but is not public yet, like some, like the quick edit, for example. So uh, one thing that we have to say is that uh, the, the studio wants to do the things the open source way. Um, so we want to contribute, we want to be part of the community. Um, and I think you know, we've shown that with some of the contribution, contributions we already did and the fact that we're here. Um, but on the other hand, we're making a movie, right? And this is always the, the trade-off. So we have to find a balance between answering production needs and finding the time to do the contributions. And this is sort of the thing that we're trying to figure out now, but um, yeah, like we've been doing this for a little over a year now, so we're still in a learning process on, on how to deal with this. Um, because there's like different contribution complexity, you could say. Um, so a simple example is bug fixes. If we find a bug because some of our artists have, artists have a problem, um, we'll look at it, We'll see if it's in master. If it is in master, we'll create a report and we, we can see if we can fix it. If we can fix it, then we'll submit the patch. Um, so there's like no question about that and, and we've been doing that for a long time now. Um, then there's performance, which sort of sits in between bug fixes and new features because sometimes it can be really complicated to fix performance issues like we've seen with the uh, undo system and, and the update cache. Um, so yeah, so those can take more time and, and also build, like sometimes you need a design for this. Um, so it takes more time on, on our side. And then new features, obviously, like we need to agree on a design uh, with the respective module, for example. Um, and we also want to build quality patches, right? We don't want to build a patch where the burden is sort of put on the reviewer and it's hard to review or hard to understand. So we want to put in the time to make sure that we have a quality patch. 
Um, and if you look at our contributions, well, you can clearly see what's happening. So um, for bug fixes, like, yeah, we, we have money bug fixes already in master. And then performance, we've shown some things. Uh, there's like some smaller performance improvements with like multiple instances and uh, for Grease Pencil and things like that. And then just two new small features that we've contributed so far. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the future and, and see what, what else we can do. Um, yeah, so that's the contributions. Um, now just a, a quick, um, quick few slides on managing our code base. So um, we have a GitLab server. We are obviously doing add-on, both add-on development and uh, Blender development. So we have a Blender repository, we have add-on repositories. Um, and what might be interesting to some is how we deal with uh, Blender and uh, Blender branches. So this is what this currently looks like. Um, our main version is based on Blender 3.3 LTS. And so you can see uh, that branching off and our main development branch is Bodyvelop. Um, this is where we add new features. Um, we have like feature branches and things like that, um, as you do. Um, and then we have a stable version of that, which is just a branch that uh, every now and then will we're branch off of the develop and that will become our stable version and then we just have um, uh, fixes on that branch and every now and then that gets merged back with uh, develop. And then one thing that might be interesting is that we also have a master branch and the idea here is that this is based on master but it includes all of our changes and every few weeks we're trying to merge that in um, like updates on master and the idea here is that we can like early on identify conflicts and uh, not have to deal with like a massive amount of merge conflicts once we try to, for example, upgrade a version, uh, which is what happened in the past and we have sort of like a bad experience with that. So now we're doing it this way where, where we have like um, smaller merge conflicts along the way, but it's easy to deal with them uh, isolated. And um, that way we can sort of keep track of, of the changes. All right, and, and that's it. Um, so we have time, I think, for a Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. So if anybody has a question, I'll, I'll repeat it and, uh, and we can answer it. I'll just start. Yes. Um, Shift and trace. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, you, like, do you actually move the, the, the keyframe data or can you have, like, pass the onion speeding uh, like, transformation information? Like, yes. So the question was how does, it, how does the shift and trace basically work? Like, does it actually move the keyframe? Um, so it's, it's a transformation matrix on the frame itself, which means that uh, we don't actually move any of the points. Um, it's, you, you can imagine it like a, a modifier but it's not a modifier, it's just like applied after the modifiers in a non-destructive way. The onion skinning just reads that? Uh, yes, because it's in the evaluated state of the object, it's, it's used for the drawing engine and, and that's how you see it on screen. Okay. Yeah, there's a question there. Yes. Yes, obviously. Um, so, like I said in the section, uh, we're trying to find a balance between, again, answering like production needs and contributing. So, it, it's a matter of, um, you know, when we find a time to say, okay, now we want to make this into a patch or, or a design. Um, what we'll probably do with like some of the features you've seen is we'll, we'll propose it as a design first and, and get feedback on that and, and see if the community likes it and things like that and then work on making the, like, the patch clean and, and contributing it back. Um, I can't give you a timeline, but um, again, like, we want to be part of the community. Uh, we, we just have to figure out how to deal with it time-wise. <laughs> yes.
seems obvious that that could be uh, useful for people who are not using necessary grease pencil. You can imagine an EV-based real-time uh, animation film being done this way. It, have you thought about that? Is it general enough to do that kind of thing? Um, yeah, so the question is, like, the sequence workflow could you could be used for basically anything, just not grease pencil uh, scenes. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's uh, it's just relying on, on Blender in the end. So it's whatever you have in your scenes that makes the difference. Um, so yeah, it would completely work. And I think on that, we should have discussions because like many people in studios are trying to do the same thing, right? So it feels like this is something that would really benefit from a community effort. And again, we are really uh, willing to be part of, of that effort. So if that can start discussions, that would be just awesome. <laughs> and uh, I think we're up, right? Yep, okay. Thank you. <laughs>